Good morning, AJC. Let us arise up and worship our God this morning.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this Sunday allowing us to come together as one in your presence, Lord. Uh, Lord, as we pray, uh, Lord, we pray that HIC Handong International Congregation becomes a house of prayer and for all nations. Allow us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Allow us to love one another, love our neighbor, and even our enemies, Lord. And please watch over HIC here. Um, HRC and everyone who's here today. And Lord, please give us clean hands and pure hearts 
as we have confessed to you in our worship. Lord, we want to lift up all the churches around the world. Lord, allow the churches to follow only Jesus and reflect only Jesus upon the world. Please bless all the pastors and missionaries and give them wisdom, strength, endurance, grace, and love that they need to do their ministry, Lord. May all the churches be an example of Jesus Christ and his teachings. Lord, we pray for Handong University that we may always follow your word. And Lord, let everything that we do bring joy to you. Uh, Lord, we also pray for, um, uh, pray that you would anoint Pastor Greg at this time with your Holy Spirit and that you will lead Pastor Greg as he speaks today. And also always protect Pastor Greg's physical health, mental health, and especially spiritual health, Lord. Uh, thank you for all that you have done. And without your grace, we would not be here today, Lord. Allow us to give thanks to you uh, daily. And at this time, open our ears and our hearts so that we can listen to your word and remember your word today, Lord. Thank you so much. Uh, and we love you, Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before you guys sit down, a little late, uh, let's go ahead and stand, move around the room, high fives, handshakes, hugs. Let's greet each other with grace and peace. God's grace is unmerited favor on your life, his peace in your circumstances, peace of mind when we're tempted to be anxious, grace and peace all around the room. Amen. Amen. We're going to go ahead and dismiss our children. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful worship and time in the word. Thank you to all of our children's leaders. Thank you for your service. Amen. If you are visiting with us, we'd just like to uh, welcome you. Welcome to HIC. In the bulletin, there's a QR code for you. Uh, if you get a chance at some point uh, to click the QR code and there's information that we could learn more about you and you also have a place where you could ask questions and learn more about us, uh, we'd love, to, love for you to do that if you have time. Um, also, we have uh, life groups that meet right after service today. Um, we have an English Connect that'll be meeting on the second floor. They'll have coffee and snacks and a discussion of the word of God. Um, so we invite you to go to that. Um, and then we have a Korean Connect that meets through Zoom. Uh, the information is there. Our sister Oprah would love to welcome you. You can uh, email her if you want. Her email account is on that, available for you. Uh, but please contact her. Just show up. The Zoom link is there. And we have a Professionals Connect that meets at the Kendrick Lounge over by the tennis courts for working professional staff, et cetera, teachers. A uh, good time of coffee, snacks, and sharing of the word of God. So we invite you to go to one of those. Uh, right after service, we do have our youth ministry. That is 7th through 12th grade. That will be meeting in the uh, annex next door on the first floor in room 108 at 1045. Uh, and so we'd love for, if you're a youth, to be able to go to that. Um, every Thursday, we have Thursday All Out, 7.30 p.m., third floor of the annex. A time of extended worship extended prayer, uh, we invite you and welcome you to go to that as well. Um, on your bulletin, there's also a, another QR code, the second one. Uh, we invite you to scan that. That'll take you to our, uh, to our cacao chat room uh, where we'll give prayer updates and updates about the church and things of that nature. It'll be a great way to stay connected together long term. Uh, and so we invite you to join that cacao. Next Sunday, this is specifically for the youth and children, we will have youth and children's ministry uh, YCM. And so obviously when children move up to YM, to youth ministry, there's some fear and trepidation. So we try to bridge that by getting together, connecting, and having a, a time of fellowship. So they will meet uh, during the service. Next semester, have a time in the word as well as fellowship and things of that nature. So that's for just so parents are aware. I'm sure youth and children are aware of this already. Uh, we do have a uh, update from the OIA, Office of International Affairs. They asked us to uh, share this with you. There have been a lot of recruiting uh, from cults, 
uh, with international students on our campus to various events off campus, whether it's English teaching, et cetera. When you get these random uh, invites, please do your research because sometimes there, there is enlistment into cults. So just to be aware of that. Uh, for our offering, for those of you that are here, obviously here, um, behind these two rows, in the very back, there are buckets where you can put your offering in. In your bulletin, there's information where you can give online. For those who are worshiping at, at home on YouTube, just scroll down the link, and there's information about how to give your offering on the YouTube link. Today, for our focus on mission, we have our missionary, Hong, who's a graduate of Handong and served as a pastor in Korea, and now is serving uh, in an unreached people group in Taiwan. It's looking at Junmo to give me affirmation. But as we, have, as we translate the books of Genesis and Acts, we pray for God to pour out remarkable wisdom upon all team members, including missionaries who work with local translators, so that the Bible may be translated accurately and appropriately. Uh, may the faith of local translators grow stronger and lives be transformed through translating the Bible. May God protect the safety of the team members and prevent any security issues from arising. May God bless Anyang Sokso Church, the sending church, making it a pre precious channel for spreading God's love and blessings. May we constantly rely on God and fully acknowledge his sovereignty in every moment. Um, just before we pray, confirm, Junmo, Taiwan? Okay. Taiwan slash another place I shouldn't say up front. But let's go ahead and uh, spend some time praying for our missionary. Uh, pray especially for Taiwan and for a, 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 another nation nearby that I can't say because this video goes up online. Um, but let's spend some time praying for our missionary. As we pray for our missionary, let's lift up uh, Taiwan. As you know, there was a major earthquake that happened there recently. Let's pray for wisdom for the leaders of that nation, for um, proper delegation to work and fix the, the, the things that were harmed and the people that were harmed. Pray for the gospel to spread there. Also pray as this is Bible translation happening in a nearby nation. Pray that God would bless that nation as well, um, that there would be favor uh, in spreading the gospel in that nation and that many people would come to know the Lord. So let's pray for both Taiwan and the neighboring nation. up Taiwan and the neighboring nation. Let's also just pray for God's blessing over Korea. Wisdom for those who have been newly elected uh, to lead this nation in a way that's righteous, that they may come to know Christ. Uh, grace for the president. Um, grace for the church, that there would be a clear preaching of the word of God and that there would be a sanctification of the Korean church, a revival in the Korean church. Pray for a special grace as God has called us to minister, especially to young people, Handong University and the International School. There be a revival amongst young people 
throughout this nation, revivals on college campuses and, and, and uh, schools, uh, K through 12s, that the young people of this nation would turn back to God and seek his face uh, and that God would do something special through the youth, the young people he's given us. Let's pray for the nation of Korea. Father, we thank you so much for hearing our prayers. We want to thank you for missionary Hung, who has gone up from outside of us and has moved on to minister. We ask that you bless his health, that you give him physical strength, wisdom, that you meet all his needs financially. Pray that you bless him and the team that's doing Bible translation. Uh, give them supernatural grace to translate the word in an accurate way that can be understood in that culture and that language. Uh, and that this people group they're trying to reach would come to know the Lord in a special way. Uh, we ask that you would make your name known. Uh, we do ask for special protection as we continue to look uh, at being sexually pure in a promiscuous world. Uh, protect our hearts, uh, deliver us from the evil one, and do a washing in this room. Sanctify us as a church. We ask that you would sanctify your church throughout the world, which has been tasked to be pure and blameless in a sinful world. Forgive us for where we have failed in this area and continue your perfect work in us and in your church. Uh, we pray all this in your son's holy name, amen. Let's go ahead and stand uh, for the reading of God's word. We're gonna be reading from 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Finally then, brothers and sisters, we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received instruction from us about how you must live and please God, as you are in fact living, that you do so more and more. For you know what commands we gave you through the Lord Jesus, for this is God's will, that you become holy, that you keep away from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own body in holiness and honor not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. In this matter, no one should violate the rights of his brother or take advantage of him because the Lord is the avenger in all these cases, as we also told you earlier and warned you solemnly. For God did not call us to impurity, but in holiness. Consequently, the one who rejects this is not rejecting human authority, but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. On your bulletin, you have a QR code. You have on your bulletin, you have in your bulletin, you have an outline. And on that outline, there is a QR code. Uh, if you click that QR code, it will take you to our Facebook page where you can uh, look at the message we are studying, the manuscript, full manuscript as we go through it, which may be helpful. Um, also, if you could continue to pray for me, I've been battling a sickness since Tuesday which has primarily been a very sore throat. Um, and it starts off bad and it, gets, and it gets better throughout the day. So preaching in the morning uh, is harder because the throat starts off sore. So appreciate extra prayers. Uh, we're gonna review what we talked about last week and then we're gonna start uh, the second part of this message. This actually will probably be a two part message so we'll see if we even finish. Um, but it won't be three parts as I thought. Um, uh, as a reminder in the context, um, the Thessalonians are a persecuted Christian group. Paul preached there for three Sabbath days, started a following of both Jews and Gentiles. Uh, and then, because the Jews became jealous of him in that, in that, in that nation, uh, they persecuted him and he had to flee. Uh, so while he had fleed away, he was in Athens and he was worried about the Thessalonians. So he sends Timothy back 
to check on them. He's worried about their faith being shaken by the persecution they are experiencing. Um, and so when, while Timothy is there, he encouraged them in the faith. When he returns, he shares positive affirmations about their faith. In chapter 1, uh, Paul praises them about their, their faith continuing, their love, and their, I think it says, in, endurance, their, their hope. They were continue to hope in the coming of the Lord. So Paul praises them for all the good things. However, there were several things that were problems in the church. And so in chapter 4, when he says finally in verse 1, he starts the ethical teachings because Paul was not able to return to them. He says, Satan hindered me time and again. Uh, so Paul starts the ethical teachings to encourage this church in the faith. And one of the primary ethical teachings was sexual purity. In verses 4, 4 through 5, he says that each of you should know how to possess his own body in holiness and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles. The word know has to do with gaining knowledge or skill to accomplish a goal. They had to learn how to be sexually pure when the culture that surrounded them was amoral, especially when it came to the area of sex. Um, we talked about this last week, but the Greco-Roman culture had very loose sexual ethics, especially for men. Men were not expected to be monogamous in marriages. They had, uh, they had mistresses, con concubines, prostitutes for experiencing sexual pleasure. The wife was primarily to have an official steward of the home and to raise up an official heir. And so uh, also when we know that homosexuality, transgenderism was normal, guys dressing like girls. In Romans 1, when Paul was describing the ancient Roman world, he says, because they chose not to acknowledge the true God, they worshiped idols, they became idolaters, but also they started to practice sexual morality, but also homosexuality. When we have turned away from the creator of sex, then it's just normal that we would abuse uh, his creation, including our bodies. And so that was normal in this ancient world. Sex was part of the mystery religions where they would have sex with hundreds to, there would be hundreds to sometimes thousands of temple goddesses. And by being intimate with the person who was closest to the god, the priestess or priest, they were, that was a way of being intimate with the gods and receiving blessing and prosperity on their crops and their businesses. So this was all normative. Uh, it seems very clear uh, that in this section, this is, a, this is something the Thessalonians were struggling with. They had come out of, some had come out of homosexuality. Some had come out of transgenderism. Some had come out of prostitution. And when you open up a door sexually, it's very hard to close that door. Uh, so Paul focuses on that in the beginning, firstly, when he begins to deal with the ethics of the Thessalonians. This was also true with the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 5, we see they were struggling with sex as well. A man was having sex with his father's wife in chapter 5. Chapter 6, apparently they were still visiting temple prostitutes. Just as sexual immorality was pervasive in that anti-God culture, it's also pervasive in our cultures as well. Especially the further we turn away from God, uh, the worse it is. We looked at, last time we together, statistics say that 70% of young men 18 to 24 watch pornography. This was a conservative statistic. There were ones that were much higher. One out of three porn viewers are women. The average age of a child to view porn is 11 years old. I was told it was nine in Korea, but I wasn't able to verify that stat. 2006, South Korea spent the most pornography, per, most money on pornography per person, about $526 USD in 2006 of all nations. 85% of men watch pornography. More than half of Korean men have paid for sex in their lifetime. This was uh, down, uh, it was around 57% in 2013. In the U.S., 56% of divorces, one person had a porn obsession. Uh, and so this is meant to show how it's, it's not only destroying us individually, but it's also destroying marriages. What young men and women are starting to expose themselves to at this age of life, many times creeps up is destroying their marriages. Um, we'll look at this stat later on if we get to it today. 
um, a person, a man who has experience, is looking at pornography in marriage, doubles his divorce rates. A woman who is looking at pornography in marriage triples her divorce rates. Maybe this goes back to the same things they struggled with in the ancient world. It was more acceptable for men to have sexual morality, less acceptable for women. So therefore, when a woman is being unfaithful in that area, it triples. Um, in the U.S., one out of four, 25% of uh, high school students currently identify as LGBTQ. Uh, the amorality in the ancient world is quickly becoming pervasive in our world today. And with it becoming more pervasive, just like the Jews who were called to be godly amongst all the pagan nations, many times they started to be just like them. When you go to the book of Judges, you see homosexuality and different things becoming normative in the Jewish culture, though they were called to be priests to the world. And so in the same way, what is happening around us in our workplaces, in our families, in our cultures, often begins to become normative for the church, unfortunately. Instead of affecting the world as we should, being salt and light, we often are affected by the world. Um, Last time we were together, we looked at five principles. I'm going to quickly cover them within two minutes, Lord willing. Uh, to be sexually pure, we must seek accountability partners. In verses 1 and 2, Timothy has come back from visiting Thessalonica. He has shared updates. Paul can't get to them. So what he does is he holds them accountable in the area of sexual purity. He challenges them with God's will is for them to be different than the culture around them in the same way. Even if we may not be struggling in this area currently, we should recognize that we're vulnerable to it. Uh, and we need accountability. As parents, my children, when they get time, have screen time, they need accountability on the screen because the devil is trying to get to our children at a young age. Um, especially when they get older, they need more accountability. Dating relationships need accountability. They need older men and older women or people of the same age who they can share with they can confess with, that they can be challenged by. We need accountability. Secondly, we looked at we need to be committed to God's word. When Paul mentions uh, that he was sharing with them God's commands that he had taught them previously, he's just repeating the teaching that he gave them while he was in Thessalonica. He's repeating them again for emphasis because they were still struggling. And so the implication is they needed God's word. Instead of being conformed to the world, they need to be transformed by the renewing of their minds. When you're watching TV, when you're listening to the radio and music, what's happening, you are being compressed and conformed to think a certain way about what a dating relationship should look like and what a marriage or that marriages are not worth your time. They all end badly. And so it's so common because people are being pressed and conformed into this world, they no longer see marriage as something good or desirable uh, for their future, because the world, what they're seeing around them and what the culture is impressing them in is that you don't need that. And so we, if we're going to be sexually pure, we must continually be in God's word, being conformed and pressed to it. Psalm 119, David was a man who struggled with lust. Every time he lusted for a woman, he went and married a new one. Um, uh, we see that he says, how can a man keep his way pure but by living according to your word. We should memorize it, especially texts that deal with issues we struggle with in this context, sexual immorality. We should memorize it. We should quote it. Um, third, to be sexually pure, we must properly define sexual immorality. We must properly define sexual immorality. The word that Paul used was the word pornea, which is the word that we get pornography from. It had to do with... Um, Se fulfilling of sexual desires outside of the marriage union. Whenever we fulfill, in fact, this word even is used uh, in dealing with our thought life. In Matthew 5, Christ said, if anyone lusts after a woman that's not his wife, he has already committed adultery with them. Uh, and so whenever we're, we're, we're satisfying those desires by fantasies or by being on the Internet, or in dating relationships, then that is uh, sexual immorality, fulfilling of sexual desires outside the marriage union. This is important because there are many young people, especially young people, that think as long as I'm not having intercourse, 
I'm not disobeying God. And so when they start to date, they open up all these doors because no one's ever defined it for them. They've never had the word defined, and therefore they're a casualty because of the silence of the church on this issue. I'll be honest with you. I was a casualty of the silence of the church on this issue. I opened doors as a young man. I opened up doors when I was a college student. As I thought as long as I wasn't having intercourse, that I was being sexually pure. Uh, and so because nobody ever taught me, no parent, no youth group leader, nobody ever mentioned certain words that may be hard to deal with, uh, I opened doors that should have been closed. And therefore, it was harder to keep them closed after that. To be sexually pure, we must avoid sexual morality at all costs. Uh, many times, Scripture says for the flee, to flee from it, to run from it. And finally, to be sexually pure, we must know ourselves and practice rigorous discipline. When Paul says, possess our own vessel, the fact he says your own vessel, this, uh, I think implies that possessing your vessel may be different than me possessing my vessel. Uh, because of doors, maybe I opened as a young man or maybe others opened with me. Um, there are, it may be a stronger battle in certain areas because of things that I have exposed myself to. And for you, it may be different. Some may have a battle with same-sex desires. And because of that, there may be certain things that stir them up that maybe don't stir me up. We all have to know our own battle, our own vessel, what, turn, what, what lights us up and what doesn't so that we can protect ourselves and be rigorous in disciplining ourselves. We need to know our own vessels well. Uh, here's the new one. To be sexually pure, and this will, if you're following along with your notes, now this will be a little bit easier to follow. To be sexually pure, we must, if it is God's will, get married and faithfully practice physical intimacy in the marriage. We must, if it is God's will, get married and faithfully practice physical intimacy in the marriage. In verse 4, when Paul calls for each person to possess his own body in holiness and honor, some commentators believe that he was focusing on the males in the church of Thessalonica. And he was calling for them to find a wife. The reason some take this view is because the word possess um, typically means to acquire, which doesn't fit well with acquire your own body or vessel. Uh, in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament and the other Greek literature, the word acquire is used of acquiring a wife. Also, the word body or vessel is at times used of a wife as well. 1 Peter 3, 7, Paul calls the, uh, the Christians in, in Turkey to dwell, to dwell, to dwell with their wives as, they, as the weaker vessel. Um, so in this case, if Paul was calling for males to get married, uh, in this case, Paul would be calling for males to get married as a protection from sexual sin. It would be the same thing he says in 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 2. Now with the regard to the issues you wrote about, it's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of immoralities, each man should have relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The problem with this view, it's a popular view, the problem with this view is that in 1 3, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, when Paul calls for the Thessalonians to be holy and to avoid sexual morality, it seems like he's referring to all the Thessalonians, both the women and the men. Uh, also, the Greek word for possess or acquire in verse 4, at times in Greek literature is used of self-mastery. Therefore, there's good reason to believe that Paul is referring to all the Thessalonians exercising self-mastery over their bodies, their own vessels, instead of only males seeking a wife. Both genders needed to control their bodies. Now, with that said, getting married and practicing physical intimacy in the marriage is one of the ways God has given us to protect ourselves from sexual temptation. And in a sense, it's a way for us to practice self-mastery over our bodies. Sex is a gift from God to married couples to develop intimacy, to get to, to know each other better, to enjoy each other, and also to procreate. But it also is meant as a protection in a world that is sexually impure. 
Therefore, for most, they should consider getting married, in part as a protection from sexual sin. With that said, in most cultures today, marriages are increasingly happening later on in life, way into the 30s, sometimes 40s, as people pursue financial success and security. Unfortunately for most, some will have grace to have late marriages, but many for most, it almost guarantees that they will live in sexual sin before they get married. When God said of Adam that it was not good for him to be alone, this meant alone socially, emotionally, spiritually, but also physically. He was going to be with a, a, a woman, and they would become one flesh. God desires for most people to get married and to choose not to or to put it off till late in life will mean struggling with sexual sin and the consequences of it. Now, certainly, some have the gift of singleness. And Paul encourages us in 1 Corinthians 7 to actually choose this gift. Uh, this would then be the only gift that you can choose. No other gift is like that. You can't choose tongues. You can't choose to be a, uh, have a gift of preaching. This is the only time it's ever used that way. He encourages us to consider it because the gift of singleness allows us to focus on serving God without distraction of a spouse or children. Uh, this is a very important gift. Those with it have done great things for the kingdom of God. Christ was single. Paul was single. John Stott from the UK, uh, as, a per, as an example of someone more recent, was single. And he used his gift in, in his writing and his teachings. However, most do not have this gift. And to stay single long term will lead them into great struggles and sexual sin. Therefore, they should prayerfully, we should prayerfully, if you're single, consider getting married as a protection from sexual morality, but also to have a partner in serving God's kingdom. Paul actually in 1 Corinthians 7 talks about marriage as a spiritual gift as well. He says some have this gift and some have another gift, referring to singleness and then implication is marriage. That means for some people, they will better serve the kingdom of God with a partner than they would as a single person. That was God's will for Adam and Eve, and it is his will. Most of you will have the gift of marriage. You will be more effective in serving God in a marriage union than you will as a single person long term. We all have a season of singleness, which we're called to steward and be good with. With that said, believers must understand that getting married in and of itself is not a protection from sexual sin. No doubt, Satan probably attacks married couples more than singles, because of the consequences of sexual sin are greater. It destroys marriages, as many will end in divorce when there's infidelity. It scars and wounds children, the next generation that grows up when, they're met, when they come from marriages that are broken. When our marriages are destroyed, it destroys both the church and society because the family is the foundation of the church. The family is the foundation of the society in Korea. And when that unit, the family, is destroyed, everything else falls apart. Marriages are under severe attack, and apart from regular sexual intimacy, marriage in and of itself does not protect from sexual temptation. 1 Corinthians 7, 3-4, Paul said it this way. A husband should fulfill his marital responsibility to his wife, and likewise a wife to her husband. It is not the wife who has the rights to her own body, but the husband. In the same way, it's not the husband who has the rights to his own body, but the wife. Do not deprive each other except by mutual agreement where we've come together and decided together for a specific time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer, or we could say spiritual disciplines. Then resume your relationship so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Paul said that when married couples neglect physical intimacy... It opens the door for Satan to tempt them. They should only neglect it for spiritual purposes, devote themselves to prayer and fasting, not because of work, not because of tiredness, not because of lack of desire, any host of excuses we can make up. When couples neglect the sexual union, Paul says Satan tempts them. Now, sometimes this temptation shows up in insecurity in the marriage. One spouse feels unattractive and undesired which leads to conflict 
in the marriage or even sexual temptation. Paul says married couples should not neglect physical intimacy. In that sense, sex in the marriage becomes a spiritual discipline. It's an act of obedience to God, to his commands. It unifies the married couple. It provides enjoyment and protection and an opportunity to serve God by bearing children. Believers should understand this about how Satan uses sexual temptation before marriage, for singles, with the majority of you here, but also within marriage. Before marriage, Satan tempts dating believers or single believers to have sex. For many courting and engaged couples, it's very difficult to stay pure until the day they say their vows. I know one couple did not have any impurity all the way through their courting period, and on the day before they got married, they fell. It's a major temptation before people get married to have sex. All of us, most of us, have struggled with that at some point. However, after marriage, Satan tempts the, the, t- tempts the new couple to neglect sex and fulfill their sexual desires outside of the marriage. For many newlyweds, this is part of premarital counseling for most, for good premarital counseling, for many newlyweds, it's a shock to find out the difficulties that come along with being faithful in the area of sex. In many marriages, sex is a sore ch- subject. There's, 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 a, there's like tension between a husband and a wife even as we talk about this. That's normal. Uh, it's a sore subject in the home. It's a place of discontent. It's all very simple. Before marriage, the temptation is to have sex. And after marriage, the temptation is to not have sex or to be unfaithful in it. When couples avoid it, it gives Satan a foothold in marriage to tempt and cause discord. If we're going to protect ourselves from sexual morality, singles should consider getting married at a young age, if at all possible. And when they are married, they should faithfully practice the physical union. They should not leave it to when they feel like it and sparks fly. But like other acts of obedience to God, they should consistently plan for it and make it a discipline to protect themselves from Satan and his temptation. With that said, this is specifically for married couples, but it will help you. It's a premarital counseling for for when you get married. One of the difficulties that causes conflict in marriages is the fact that people have different libidos. What's libido mean? It's typical for one mate to desire to be more physically intimate than the other mate. That's normal in marriages as well. A helpful verse to guide couples in this area and future married couples in this area, most of you are future married couples, is Philippians 2, 3 through 5. Instead of being motivated by selfish ambition or vanity, each of you should, in humility, be moved to treat one another as more important than yourself. Each of you should be concerned not only about your own interests, but about the interests of others as well. You should have, or let this mind be in you that was once in Christ Jesus. Treating others and their desires as more important than our own means, for married couples in the physical union, one person will get more than one wants, and the other will get less than they want, in order to put the other's desires first. This is true not only in marriage, but all of ministry. As Christians, we should put others' needs and wants before our own since that's what Christ did when he left heaven. In Philippians 2, the context is, he became a human and died for us out of obedience to God, out of love for us, and at great cost to himself. He put your desires before his own. Even before the cross, he says, uh, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. It's not something he desired. But in putting your interest first, obedience to God first, he gave his life for us. We do the same as we love our spouses in every way. Again, to be sexually pure, believers, as a general principle, must pursue a marriage partner and faithfully practice physical intimacy in the marriage. This means that young people must prayerfully plan for marriage at an early age, and I think parents should help them think about that because we understand the struggles they will go through as a protection, and married couples must plan and practice physical intimacy for the health and protection of their union uh, who the evil one, because the evil one wants to destroy them. Let me add an extra comment in here. It's become increasingly common for married couples, for one to live in Seoul, and for one to live in Pohang, and for one to live in uh, Indonesia, and one living in Korea because of work purposes, or for children, or for different reasons. Let me tell you, you can't 
practice 1 Corinthians 7. You can't practice 1 Corinthians 7 uh, not forsaking this union except for prayer or for spiritual reasons if it's a long-term plan to live apart. You just can't do it. Uh, it destroys, it opens the door for Satan to destroy many marriages. The consequences on the marriage are harmful. The consequences on the children are harmful. It gives them a bad image of what a marriage union should be like. Uh, I've had young Christians who get married and then one goes get the PhD while, they'll, while they go finish their masters over here. I'm like, look, even in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy, they were commanded that they should, uh, that a soldier could not go off to war in their first year of marriage. That for, and statistics bear this out. The number one year of divorce is what? Year number one. It's because then we set the foundation for our marriages. And whatever foundation you build in that season, it affects you long term. If you have a bad foundation, the rest of the time is many times difficult. And so um, because of putting work or career, other things first, it's becoming increasingly common for others to put their marriages, the health of their marriages, the health of their children in Jeopardy. This is a wise principle for you. Premarital counseling, no cost um, for you for your future. Next point. To be sexually pure, we must love our brothers and sisters by protecting them. We must love our brothers and sisters by protecting them. Verse 6. In this matter, no one should violate the rights of his brother or take advantage of him. Because the Lord is the avenger in all these cases. As we also told you earlier and warned you solemnly. When Paul says, um, when a person commits sexual morality, he violates or takes advantage of another person. No one is an island to themselves where they are not affecting others. The person watching pornography violates a daughter, a sister, a mother, a son, a brother, or a father. The woman who sleeps with someone else's husband violates his wife and children. A man who sleeps with a young female robs her of the virginity she was meant to offer her future husband. In addition, as believers, when we live in sexual morality, we defraud our churches and the believers within them. Why? Because we take away from them the godly example, the godly witness, we were meant to provide for them. We defraud our churches when we're not living in purity. We also make them more prone to fall in sexual sin as they are tempted again by our examples. Therefore, one of our motivations to be sexually pure should be to love others and protect them. In 1 Corinthians 13, 7, Paul said that a characteristic of true love is protecting others. And, uh, and he says this, about love, it always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. In 1 Corinthians 13, 5, he said it, it's also not self-seeking. However, the opposite of both is true when we're in sexual sin. Sexual sin is totally self-motivated, even when it's done with the consent of others and under the banner of, oh, I love him and she loves me. It doesn't protect the other's purity. It doesn't always protect it only cares about satisfying one's lust. To truly love someone means to want what's best for them. But sexual immorality, according to scripture, is a sin against God, a person's body, and also others. Sexual immorality is selfish and degrading. God made our bodies, including our bodies as they get older, with great dignity. As we're made in the image of God and meant to glorify him with it. However, when we pervert ourselves... By indulging in sexual sin, even if it's just of the mind, we degrade what God meant to be glorious. He set an image in the garden that was meant to reflect him. When the animals looked at Adam and Eve, they were meant to see the glory of God. This was normal in the ancient world. Um, the, the, the word there was used of a, a statue or an imprint. That you would go to a statue, you go to Egypt, and you would see a statue of Pharaoh. So all would know this was his realm. In the same way, we are meant to be on this earth and reflect the Godhead, to glorify him by how we live. So when we degrade our bodies, we degrade the God who made us in his image. To protect ourselves from sexual impurity, 
we must love others by protecting them from sexual sin. This will include giving attention to our clothing, to not tempt others by causing them to stumble in their mind or their body. In 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 10, Paul said this specifically to the women in Ephesus. He said this, Likewise, the women are to dress in suitable apparel with modesty and self-control. Their adornment must not be with braided hair or pearls or expensive clothing, but with good deeds, as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. Apparently, when the women in Ephesus went to worship on a Sunday, they were drawing attention to themselves by the way they dressed or their lack of dress instead of to God. They were dressing very luxuriously and provocatively, as was common in the sexually promiscuous culture of Ephesus. Many commentators believe they were modeling the prostitutes who were exalted in that culture. They were the closest to God. They were temple, they were the most closest uh, in the same way in a, some Christian cultures they lift up the, the pastor, the muxanim. The priest, the temple priestess, who was a prostitute, was exalted in that culture. And so uh, many commentators believe they were modeling the prostitutes with their extravagant dress, suggestive attire, and the beaded hair. John Christendom, a church father, summarized the verse this way. Imitate, imitate not, therefore, the courtesans, which meant prostitutes. For by such a dress they allure many lovers. Unfortunately, in our culture, uh, I can't say much about the Korean culture, but in the American culture, unfortunately, the fashion styles are not typically developed by modest women. Uh, many times they are very promiscuous women. They're known for that. And they have million dollar uh, uh, clothing lines, etc., that come along with it. Their own, tele uh, their own reality TV shows. When the Ephesian women dressed like wealthy prostitutes and attended church, they were distracting others from worshiping God and tempting others in the congregation both by their wealth and their beauty. With their clothing, they were defrauding God and others. Paul said this was not proper for women who professed to worship God. Um, certainly this doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with wanting to dress attractively to make oneself pretty. The Proverbs 31 woman was dressed in purple, which was a symbol of wealth in those days, Proverbs 31, 22. However, there's a problem when fashion consumes a person, is immodest, distracts from God, and authentic relationships, which was apparently happening in Ephesus, is also happening in Turkey in 1 Peter 3. As with the women in Ephesus in Turkey, this seems to be a sin that women in general are prone to. The world culture, which Satan is over, consistently promotes the female body as alluring, and meant to sell all products under the sun. This creates great insecurity in many females as they try to live up to the beauty standards that are promoted in society. Perfect skin, perfect body, voluptuous in certain areas. Uh, and so therefore they struggle with great insecurity, sometimes depression. In seeking to promote the female body sexually, the clothing styles are commonly geared to attract the opposite sex and to gain admiration from the same sex. The pants, the shorts, the skirts, continue to get shorter, smaller, tighter, and more revealing. Um, if a girl is going to be modest in many cultures today, it's going to be very frustrating for them when they shop because modest clothes are rarely in style. Comment I probably shouldn't add in here, but I was so excited to see baggy pants coming back, and my daughter got some baggy pants. I'm like, yes, let's buy five pair of baggy pants, right? As many baggy pants as you want, right? I was like, thank you, Lord. Because we're going to fight otherwise, right? I'm all about the baggy clothes. So thankful they came back in style. Um, let's keep it up. Amen. Um, if, however, we, if we're going to protect our purity and others, we must think about protecting others and ourselves more than what is stylish and what we like when we buy clothes. We must, in love, think about what is modest, God honoring, and not tempting in any other way. With that said, though this may be a sin that females are more prone to, as in Ephesus and in Turkey, again, 1 Peter 3 says something similar, it's certainly one that guys commit as well. As one gains a little bit more muscle, the shirt's worn typically, instead of buying, they gain more muscle, but instead of buying a bigger shirt, they tend to buy a smaller shirt. Um, so it's more tight fitting. Uh, again, to get the admiration of the same sex, man, you're kind of buff, man, you're in the gym, right? 
and to draw the allure of the opposite sex. As mentioned, the fashions of the day are commonly meant to promote sex because it sells, but also because Satan is over the world system and trying to destroy everyone through it. Uh, if we're going to protect ourselves and others from sexual sin, we must love others by protecting them from anything that might cause them to stumble sexually. This will include not, uh, not committing sexual morality, which hurts others and us, but also practicing modesty in our uh, clothing. Verse 6 again, Paul said, In this matter, no one should violate the rights of a brother or take advantage of him. Here's the next one. To be sexually pure, we must fear God's judgment. We must fear God's judgment. Verse 6 says, because the Lord is the avenger in all these cases, as we also told you earlier and warned you solemnly. Um, verse 6, God has promised to take vengeance on those who practice sexual sin and therefore violate and take advantage of others. This is not just referring to when someone is taken advantage of against their will, as in the case of sexual harassment, molestation, or rape. Certainly, God will bring judgment in those situations. But it also refers to when people willingly engage in sexual morality or tempt others to do so. We see warnings of this throughout Scripture. Colossians 3, 5 through 6, Paul says this. So put to death whatever in your nature belongs to the earth. Sexual morality, impurity, shameful passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things... The wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. Hebrews 13, 4, uh, the writer says this, Marriage must be honored among all, and the marriage bed kept undefiled. For God will judge sexually immoral people and adulterers. Matthew 5, 30 said in the context of warning people about lusting after a person who's not their spouse, If your right hand cause you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better to lose one of your members and your whole body be thrown into hell. God judges sexual sin, including sexual sin of the mind. In what ways will God uh, judge those who practice sexual sin? This judgment could take place in many ways, both presently and eternally. It, it could take place through a person getting a sexually transmitted infection, a STI or STD, they called it when I was younger. Studies show that one in two sexually active people will get an STI by the age of 25. Uh, half, if you are, I hate to use it, I'm not even going to go there. But, I mean, you can almost go to a college campus and be like, look to your left, look to your right. One out of two of you are going to have an STD by the time you graduate from grad school, 25 years old. Syphilis, chlamydia, gonorrhea, HIV, among others. In fact, studies show that 80% of men and women in the U.S., will have an STI at some, at some point in their life. Because sexual morality is so pervasive, 80%. Again, I, I don't have statistics for, uh, for Korea. I apologize for that. Um, but 80% in the U.S. And I assume it's the same most places around the world, if not higher. Now, most STIs can be cured, but not all of them. Many people will experience God's judgment through sexually transmitted disease that cause pain, embarrassment, and sometimes even death. Many will experience God's judgment for sexual morality through difficulty in their marriages. Studies show that those who have sex before marriage have worse marriage outcomes, including less satisfaction in their relationships, less enjoyment in their sex, and are more prone to divorce than those who choose to wait to have sex until they get married. Many of us carry baggage into our marriages um, that weigh us down and affect the pleasure of our marriage. In addition, as I mentioned previously, statistics say that when, you, when uh, men use pornography in marriage, their divorce rate doubles. Uh, when women use pornography, it triples. Again, this is a consequence uh, for sexual immorality. It affects many people's marriages. In addition to no one's surprise, those who use pornography have higher rates of infidelity. They're more tempted outside the marriage. They're more prone to cheat on their spouses. Certainly many of God's judgments on the sexually immoral 
are simply natural, natural consequences of sexual sin. If we continually watch sexual morality on the TV or the internet, we'll be more prone to get, engage in it and experience the consequences of it on our marriages, including disease, infidelity, and divorce. Furthermore, though there is conflict in studies, many show that those who, ha those who have casual sex are more prone to mental health issues, including anxiety, low self-esteem, regret, and depression. One second, sorry. Uh, obviously, just, this, just, this just makes sense. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man commits is outside the body, but he who commits sexual morality sins against his own body. He's sinning against himself. And so we sin against ourselves. Our bodies, again, can lead to disease. We sin against our minds, leading to all types of mental illness. But we also sin against our spirits in that sexual immorality negatively affects our relationship with God and opens the door to the devil in our lives. Uh, this is true of all sin. In Psalm 66, 18, David said, If I cherish, if I nurture iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And when we're walking in various sins, including sexual morality, it hinders our relationship with God. We have a hard time enjoying his presence, discerning his guidance, understanding his word. It's dry. We can't get anything from it when we're reading in the morning. We also have a hard time enjoying his people. Matthew 5, 8 says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. When we're living in unrepentant sin, including sexual morality, it will hinder our ability to see and know God as we should want to. Now, what if we confess our sexual sin to God and turn from it? How will that affect the consequences we experience? Now, certainly God uh, will forgive all sin. It's a clear promise. Uh, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But with that said, because God forgives us doesn't mean he takes away the consequences. We see this in the story of David. David committed both adultery and murder. Adultery with Bathsheba mur married, uh, murdered the husband, Uriah. The consequence, according to the Mosaic law, of adultery was capital punishment, death. The, capital pun the, 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 uh, the just punishment for murder was also capital punishment. However, God told him when he confessed it, God promised him that he would not die, but that the sword would never depart from his household, 2 Samuel 12.10. Eventually, as you know, his son Amnon raped his daughter Tamar. And Tamar's brother, Absalom, eventually killed Amnon. Later, Absalom tried to kill his father David and take over the kingdom. Though God forgave David, God did not remove all of the consequences of his sin. He certainly, by his grace, removed some of them. He wasn't going to die. Likewise, though we repent of sexual sin, it does not remove the images, the memories, and the, the potential consequences on ourselves and others, uh, which gives Satan a door to continually attack us or others with. In addition, sexual failures, as with all sin, makes us more prone to fall into those same temptations. It's always easier to keep a door closed that's never been opened. That's just a reality. It's always easier to keep a door closed that has never been opened. God is the avenger of sexual sin, both in this life and in the next. For true believers who stumble in this area, we will never be eternally judged for our sins because God judged them on Christ on the cross. Romans 8.1 says, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. However, we will receive God's discipline in this life to turn us away from unrepented sin, and to make us holy. Hebrews 12, 6 says, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son he accepts. In addition, not only will we receive discipline in this life, but possibly loss of reward in the next. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15 says, When considering our coming before the judgment seat of Christ for reward, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw. Each builder's work will be plainly seen, for the day will make it clear. 
because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what kind of work each has done. If what someone has built survives, he will receive a reward. If someone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as though through the fire. Matthew 5.19, similarly, So anyone who breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever obeys and teaches others to do so will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. There can be eternal consequences in the loss of reward for uh, various sins, including sexual sin. Finally, those who repeatedly live in sexual sin without repentance, though they profess Christ as their Lord and Savior, their actions may prove that they were never truly born again. Paul said this to the Corinthians who were being tempted in the area of sexual sin. Again, 1 Corinthians 5, a man is having sex with his father's wife. 1 Corinthians 6, apparently they're still visiting prostitutes. Um, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, he warns them as I'm warning you and myself today. Do you not know, um, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived by what anybody tells you. The sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, passive homosexual partners, practicing homosexuals, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, the verbally abusive, and swindlers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you once lived this way, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Paul told them to not be deceived because apparently some in the church were probably teaching loose sexual ethics, as though how we live with our bodies doesn't matter to God after we've been saved. They could not be more wrong. How we live proves whether we've been born again or not. Repentance begins at salvation, but repentance, if you're saved, continues throughout your life. You fail, but you get back up. Proverbs says the righteous man falls seven times, but gets back up. He will not, or she will not, continue to live this way. She will fight to be holy. Therefore, those who continually engage in sexual sin on the internet or with their significant others, without repentance, those who practice homosexuality without repentance, those who live lifestyles of sin in general, are not part of the kingdom of heaven, according to Scripture. Becoming a true follower of Christ changes our relationship to sin, including sexual sin. And if it does not, our profession of faith has not changed our eternal destiny. We saw this in Matthew 7, 23, where many would call him Lord, Lord, and said, I cast out demons, I did many mighty works in your name. And he says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. To proclaim Christ, to serve in the church, but yet your profession of faith doesn't change how you live uh, your relationship with sin, means that you have never been born again. That's what he says. He didn't say, I knew you and I, I, now I don't know you. He never knew them. Their lifestyle of unrepented sin while professing Christ and even serving the church proved that they had never started at repentance and continued a lifestyle of repentance as a proof of salvation. If we're going to be sexually pure, Paul's point here is we must fear God's judgment. He was speaking to believers when he said, cast off, cut off your hand and pluck out your eye because it's better to lose a member than to spin, go to hell. Again, using metaphor to describing whatever you look at, whatever you do, it's better. You still, even though you profess to follow me, if you live a lifestyle of sin, you are not part of this kingdom. He was very harsh in challenging those who followed him. In the same way that I should be as I preach the word to myself and to you. God is the avenger of those who violate themselves by cultivating their illicit sexual lust. He is the avenger of those who violate others by tempting them through their clothing or lack of clothing. He brings vengeance on those who take part in, in casual sex. He brings vengeance on those who force themselves on others and take what is not theirs. In Matthew 18, 6, Christ said this, But if anyone causes any of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a huge millstone around his neck and for him to be drowned in the open sea. God takes his children's welfare and purity very seriously, just as any good father does. With, with his children who willfully commit sexually sin and bring others down with them, he will discipline them severely. And many of the consequences may never go away, though there is forgiveness. And those who are not his children, 
they will experience, experience consequences in this life and eternally. Sexual immorality, according to Paul, again, warning these believers, will be judged by God. It may seem like the world and disobedient believers are having fun through their promiscuous lifestyles. However, Galatians 6.6 6 says this, do not be deceived. God will not be made a fool of, for a person reaps what he sows. Again, they will receive judgment in this life, often through natural consequences and potentially eternal judgment in the next. If we're going to abstain from sexual sin, we must fear God's discipline. Proverbs 9.10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom and foolishness in the Proverbs isn't about intellectual ability, it's about righteousness. Psalm 14.1, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Uh, it's not an intellectual is issue, it's a moral, spiritual issue. To live a wise life is to worship God and love him. We must fear God's discipline to keep us on the right path. Do we fear God? We can tell part, tell in part by how we respond to sexual temptation. We watch it on the TV, on the internet, for entertainment, through R-rated and mature movies. Do we engage in it through pornography? Do we engage in it by tempting God's sons and God's daughters through our clothes or lack of it? Do we violate our bodies and others through sexual activity? Fearing God is the beginning of wisdom and therefore leads to a pure life. Our last point. To be sexually pure, we must remember God's high call on our lives, his great empowerment for it, and pursue it. Verses 7 through 8. For God did not call us to impurity, but in holiness. Consequently, the one who rejects us is not rejecting human authority, but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. When Paul says God did not call us to impurity, he's talking about our call to salvation. When you, as a child in a Christian home, heard the gospel by your parents or at church, or as an unbeliever, heard it at Handong or somewhere else, and you received the gospel, this is what we call the effectual call. There's a general call that, call that goes forth as people, people preach the gospel throughout the world, but not everybody accepts it. When we accept that gospel, we are effectually called, and many times we limit our understanding of it. We think we're called just to be in heaven and not hell, or, um, or to have a relationship with God or not to have a relationship with God. Paul said it's not just that. He saved you for holiness. Um, holiness is kind of like this bottle of water. This is my bottle of water. I get to drink this bottle of water. I get to use it how I want to use it. It's not your bottle of water. It's been sanctified. It's been set apart for my use, not your use. Especially since I'm sick, you really don't want this bottle of water. Uh, in the same way, when God saved you, he set you apart for his use, not your use. Not what you want to watch on the TV. Not how you want to live. Not with what you, you want to do with your life. You are set apart for his use. And so he reminds them of this great call, not just to heaven, not just to know him, but to be used and set apart for his purposes. That's true of each one of us. And then he reminds them of the empowerment that comes with this call. He says he's given you the Holy Spirit. The reason that God gives us the Holy Spirit is it enables us to live the specific call he has given on your life. He's called you to let no corrupt thing come out of your mouth. He's called you to think on these things. He's called you to be, um, be holy as he is holy. The empowerment for this is through the Holy Spirit, which he has given each one of you if you are a believer in God. Paul said the same thing in 1 Corinthians 6, by implication, 618, in dealing with sexual, uh, sexual morality. He says, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, whom you have from God and you are not your own, that the Holy Spirit owns us, but he also empowers us? That's his job. Whereas in our flesh, apart from the Spirit, we are innately drawn to sexual morality, degrading our bodies. But the Spirit gives us new affections, a desire to be holy, a desire to be righteous, a desire to serve God with our lives. He gives us uh, fruits, desires, and fruits of those desires. Galatians 5, 22 through 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, controlling your mind, controlling your body. These fruits empower us to be holy and pure, including conquering sexual temptation. How do we access the fruits of the Spirit so we can conquer our fleshly desires and walk in holiness, which we've been called to. We've been called to a holy life. Galatians 5.16, in talking about 
how both of us, I mean, if you're a believer, you have both a spirit and a flesh, and that there's a fight happening in every true believer today, a fight. Uh, and if, you're, if your, flesh is, your flesh wins, you'll live in sexual morality. If your flesh wins, you're living lust. Galatians 5.19, in describing the works of the flesh, the first one is sexual morality, impurity, and depravity. We're all prone to this naturally by our sinful nature, which we all have. But if you're born again, his, his call to be holy came with an empowerment through the Holy Spirit. And so he says in Galatians 5.16, live in the Spirit or walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill your fleshly desires. You will not fulfill your fleshly desires. Therefore, in this sense, we walk in the Spirit by obeying what God's Word says. We walk in the Spirit by fellowship with the saints, accountability, which we talked about before, by worship. We walk in the Spirit by daily prayer and daily worship. And so in some sense, you can look at your failures in sin, in whatever areas it may be, and specifically sexual sin, as almost a hunger pain. What's a hunger pain? It's a signal that you need to eat. And so when Pastor Greg is struggling with his eyes, with what he looks at, or how I com com conversate with my wife or my children, being harsh in my words, it's a signal that I need to eat. I need to walk more in the Spirit. It's a signal that maybe I've moved instead of living or I'm making my home in the things of the Spirit. I'm kind of like a visitor. A visitor is like, maybe I'll read my Bible today. Maybe I won't. Maybe I go to church on Sunday. Maybe I won't. They're a visitor to the things of the Spirit instead of living. And so what God does, many times, one of the ways he trains us in whatever battles we have is he's constantly training us to make our home in the Spirit. Walking is a moment-by-moment -moment progress. Moment-by-moment -moment progress in a certain direction. And as we do that daily, by getting up in the morning, to have time in the Word, by worshiping Him throughout the day, giving thanks in every situation, including when you have tests and exams, by uh, having fellowship with one another, confessing your sin to others, as you moment by moment progress, instead of staying in the same place, He empowers you to not fulfill the desires of the flesh. That means if I'm being dominated by the flesh right now, I'm living in some type of addiction in my spiritual life, it's a signal that I must live in the spirit more. If we are going to, um, if we're going to be sexually poor, we must remember God's high call. He's called you to purity. He's set apart you for himself and for his own calling. But he's also given you an empowerment through the spirit of God to have victory. I want to invite EPT up here. How can we be sexually pure in a promiscuous world? We must seek accountability partners. You've got to have people that you feel comfortable with um, confessing sin to. You've got to have people that you invite to ask you hard questions. Uh, sometimes couples will come to me who are dating or looking at getting married, and they, and they give me permission, or I'm like, if you want me to do this, you got, I have to have permission, to ask you hard questions to make sure that you are doing okay and to advise you so you can do right. You need to give people that type of ability in your life, young uh, young men and young women like Timothy's, but also older mothers and fathers like Paul's, as they held them accountable. We must be committed to God's word. We must know the definition of sexual immorality. Many people fail because they, ha they have never even defined it. We must avoid it at all costs. We must know ourselves and practice rigorous discipline. Your battle may be different than my battle. Maybe I've opened doors that you haven't, and therefore my battle is stronger, harder than yours. i got to be more vigorous and disciplined than maybe you do. We must, if it is God's will, get married, possibly at a young age, and faithfully practice physical intimacy in the marriage union. We must love our brothers and sisters and protect them. We should not defraud others by our clothing, by our acts, by our flirtatious conversations, which stir them up and then leave them to the battle they struggle with. We must fear God's judgment who promises to discipline sexual sin. And we must remember God's high call. He didn't call you just to salvation. He didn't call you just to a relationship. He called you for holiness. He called you to serve him. And he's got a different call on each one of our lives. It's a general call, different th ways that we're called to serve him, but specific ways. And in order for you to walk in that, you must live in the empowerment by the Spirit. You've got to stop being a visitor. Not this, I may read the word of God, I may not read the word of God, I may worship, I may pray. You need to be progressing. You need to be walking and progressing in the same direction. And as you do that, there's a promise. I hold on to it all the time in my life. Galatians 5.16. 
I walk in the Spirit, if I live in the Spirit, I will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He's empowered you to be holy. Um, Let's take a second to respond in prayer. We have prayer prompts on your bulletin, but also up above. Um, Pray for God to forgive our church and the church around the world uh, for its sexual sin and willingness to confront it. Pray for God to cleanse and deliver his church from sexual morality so we can be a pure and blameless bride. Pray for God to bond us together with people who hold us accountable. Pray for God to draw us to the word in a deeper way in this season. Pray for grace to be spiritually disciplined. I forgot to add this up here. Forgive me for that. It's probably the most important one. Pray for God to strengthen the marriages of the married couples we have in our congregation, including in physical intimacy. Pray for godly spouses for the singles, the majority of you. Pray that God would provide godly spouses. He would be protecting them. He'd be making them righteous, training them to be holy now so they can come together and serve long term. Pray that God would deliver us from from satanic attacks and temptation sexually. Pray for God to sanctify us. Let's spend some time in prayer and response. Let's go ahead and stand. We're just going to sing a chorus of one of the songs, and then we'll, we'll pray. Maybe give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. lift our hands to the Lord in a form of worship, also to receive. Father, we thank you that you're good. We thank you that you're perfect. We thank you, Lord, that you have called us to salvation, to a relationship with you, but you've also called us to be holy in a world that is amoral, in a world that is going further away from you. And Father, we confess the difficulty of this calling, but we also confess the empowerment of this calling through your Holy Spirit. And so, Father, pour out your Spirit in a deeper way on each person right now. Empower us to have joy. Empower us to have love for God, love for others. Empower us to have self-control over our mind and our actions. Empowerment to love others more than ourselves. We thank you for who you are, and we thank you for your Holy Spirit. Give us grace to walk in worship, walk in prayer, to walk in service towards others, to live in the things of the Spirit so we will not fulfill the lust of our flesh. Sanctify our church so we can be a light on this campus at HIS and at Handong. Sanctify us so we can be a light as we go home to visit family and friends. Sanctify your church throughout the world to be salt and light in every place and every nation and every tongue so that you may receive the glory. We thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers. 
And we thank you for your forgiveness and your deliverance that comes through your spirit and through Christ's work on the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap. Thank you, Father. God bless you. Have a wonderful Lord's Day.